Welcome to part two of the interview recorded on February 19th, 2018 at ETC in Mazomani, Wisconsin. I was reading an article about ETC, and in that article I discovered that ETC is the largest exporter in the state of Wisconsin, and that you beat out cheese. Well, okay, it's not, there's a little bit of, um, alternative facts in that statement. Okay. okay. Um, at one point, uh, we had, uh, well, first of all, Wisconsin is America's dairy land, because mm -hmm. that's what's on our license plates, oh, nice. and right. that's why they call us cheese heads and all of that. And so, um, other than the fact, we wear cheese-shaped hats at football games. Um, but the, uh, at this point, I saw a news story that I think artis artisanal cheese was selling so much into Europe, and we were selling more of that in Dimmer. So I had an opportunity to meet the governor, and who was not of my political party, and I went up to him and I said, Governor Thompson, I want to make a suggestion. And he said, and he said what is it? And I introduced myself, said what we did, and I said, I just want to tell you that ETC sells more dimming products into Europe than we sell cheese, so I think we should rename, have a new motto, which is Wisconsin, the Dimmer State. And he didn't do it. I don't understand. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was totally brilliant. And what's sadly ironic is we're really not, California, I think, makes more milk and cheese than we do now, and we are, in fact, the dimmer state. <laughs> <laughs> but alas, I'm not supposed to throw my politics into things, so I'll shut up now. You and ETC have received a number of awards over the years, um, illumination, uh, Night of Illumination. The Which is really cool, you get this big broadsword. You get a big broadsword. It's yeah. very cool. And where do you keep it? Um, the only thing I've used it for, it's really good for slicing pan, uh, like sheet cakes. You can, oh, okay. Uh, right. Grid them out really well for okay. it. <laughs> uh, the Tony Gatelier. Gatelier. Gatelier, yeah. excuse me. Um, you won, or not won is the wrong word, uh, you were awarded uh, something from the governor. The state of Wisconsin for support of the arts. Yeah. yeah. What, what was that about? Um, there was, this was started by um, a fellow in Madison, and for about 15 years, or maybe 20, they would select um, somebody who had supported the arts in Wisconsin, and the governor would recognize that person with an award. Um, and so... I guess they ran out of people and came up with me. And it was about, it wasn't me personally, it was the work ETC has done to support um, right. support the arts, both in Wisconsin and other places. Right. And um, it was a nice award. Turns out I was the last one to get it because we now have a governor who doesn't give out awards for arts. Right. Um, but the, uh, I think it recognized substantially the efforts, our philanthropic efforts are aimed in two directions. Um, it, it used to be that somebody would come up to me and hit me up for, you, you, people do this to you all the time, on, figure you must be rich and you can donate to things. And depending on how I felt, they could come away with an entire nursing station for a hospice thing or nothing with the same request the next day. And this just didn't make much sense. So um, actually my wife Susan um, put together a philanthropy program that we decide how much we want to, uh, we can spend in the year, and then about a third of it goes into community betterment where there's a group of volunteer employees who look at um, community grants that come in for, you know, for example, the uh, service animal organization did really well for a few years because they brought the dogs in and the, the committee got to play with them. Right. But no, it's much more serious and they're very conscientious about this. And the other two-thirds go into uh, supporting the arts, and a lot of it is in-kind do donation of equipment right. and such. Um, and so uh, the program Susan put together had true criteria in it, and it has really flourished to the point that we now have um, hundreds of applications. And it's interesting. We found in the support in almost all of this that we can do better by putting out a bunch of small grants rather than a whole theater worth of stuff. Right. Um, you know, eight source four juniors to the um, Partyville players makes a bigger difference than a dimming system to a university. 
And so um, the, but that program kind of evolved and organized what had been a very informal process. Um, you know, there are theater communities or theaters that we have supported very well. There's a really good Shakespeare, the, um, uh, oh, what is, um, in Spring Green, um, American Players Theater, Players Theater yeah. which has uh, been a great program and we've supported mm-hmm. significantly over the time. Um, we donated a bunch of equipment, it's a whole light rigging system to a space in the Union Theater, which is where we did our first Your first first thing. Yeah. So, but generally, we aim aim the giving at uh, um, at a level that it really makes a big difference to many people. Right. Um, and it, you know, it's it's good. It, it's the especially the community betterment stuff. The, mm-hmm. the employees take that so seriously and are so conscientious, and um, you know they. You, they don't approve a grant unless it's unanimous. So you end up with discussions and right. and such. It's really encouraging. Right. And the group that's making those decisions, they're volunteers. Yep. Volunteers from right. the company. From the company. Yep. Terrific. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a great program. It is. And so that you know that that stuff really led into the the award. Right. Several years ago, I think it was 2013. The Long Reach Long Riders came through, and you and some of the, your people, Patrick Stewart in particular, put together just a wonderful, wonderful reception for us. And I, lots of uh, rescue and fire department equipment on the street, you know, parading in, and the kazoos mm-hmm. on the, on, in the parking lot as, as we, this was in Middleton. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it was great fun, but it was also an acknowledgement of the work that the Long Reach Long Riders are doing, and, and you're familiar with that program, right? Yeah. Well, it's all supporting the behind-the-scenes charity, which is something that is needed in our business, um, especially because so many people have not, in their careers, built up any kind of safety net, right. and so um, the what you do or what that the the Long Reach Long Riders. Long Reach Long Riders. Yeah, got that right. Um, Do to support it raises a tremendous amount of money. What we've done over the time is um, there's uh, Chris Miserac, who's one of our software programmers, wanted to learn how to write apps when they were new. So he wrote an app that um, was a remote for our consoles. And we were trying to figure out, can we make any money out of this? And a suggestion came from Luke Delwich, who at that time was actually working in in our London office. he said, well, why don't we donate the proceeds to um, the behind-the-scenes char- charity? Right. And um, we said, sure, we figured that would be about $1.95. Um, <laughs> but uh, we also said there was a similar organization in, in the UK, um, Light Relief. Right. So we said sales into Europe would go to Light Relief and sales in the states would go to behind the scenes, right. and we priced the app at fifty bucks. And you know, the apps cost ninety nine cents or nine ninety nine if they're a lot. Um, but it was useful enough that people paid for it. And I think one of the reasons is we said the money goes to this charity, uh, it goes to behind the scenes. I think that was a big reason for it. You know, right. people some people whinged, but they kind of get over it. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm surprised. I don't know what the number is, but I'm surprised that. How much that has con- been a- allowed us to contribute? Um, the, the uh, you know, kind of every trade show, I feel like we donate a check. Another large check. Another big cardboard check, check yeah. it's um, handed off. Yeah, yeah. and um, we don't do this for the glory. Uh, this is something that is is interesting when when you donate. People say, "Well, can we put your name in the program?" We actually don't. It's not about that. It's about where the, what the money can do. Right. Um, you, you should know that the Long Reach Long Riders are, are aware of, of your Pledge of Product donations because you're number two on the, the yeah. list of mm-hmm. donate, donate, people who donate to organizations that donate to behind the scenes, and we're number one. Can and I just say, though, that I don't think our app has ended up, up with anybody upside down underneath a motorcycle? That's I'm true. Just, you know, That's true. So there's a price for success. There is. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> It's 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 a, a, a from our perspective, it's a lovely, friendly competition sure. that benefits behind the scenes. So I a, hope we each win. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. 
So when you're not working, and I realize that's only about three minutes out of every given day, um, what does Fred Foster relaxing look like? Slouching on a couch watching Law and Order. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's whatever my family thinks. Um, uh, historically, it was sailing. Um, then when I lived in London, I took up pond yachting, which is radio control um, mm -hmm. sailboats on the round pond. I'm still a card-holding member of the London Model Yacht Club. They let an American in. Um, and, but I, and I did that when I came back for a while. But right now, when I can do it. Um, I love working in the woodshop building stuff. Um, the, uh, I had promised myself as a kid when I tried to learn to ski in Wisconsin, it was like downhill ice skating, and I promised I wouldn't try again until I could go to a real mountain. And mm -hmm. so about four years ago, Susan arranged for the family to go to um, the Rockies, and I took a ski, because as a kid, I could only turn left. It doesn't work very well for skiing. Yeah. And so, you know, 45 years later, I found that just thinking about it, it's kind of like the music man. I could turn right as well. But um, so skiing is something I kind of live for in the, the winter time. Oh, great! Um, we're going to Lake Louise in um, okay. Alberta, yeah, Alberta yeah. Um, in about a week. Excellent! So, mm -hmm. Great place. Yeah. Very beautiful. Up there. I have no desire to uh, bash moguls. My, my <laughs> simple goal is once during a ski trip, I want one graceful run. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's really where I am. Yeah, we're we're of like minds in that. One. Do you read? Do you get a chance to read? Not much. Um, the uh, sadly, work is a big part of it, and um, not sadly, not for me. It's mm -hmm. very important. And um, one of the other things that is interesting, um, when the company was very small, uh, Susan, um, even before we were married, worked for the company, and then we had Katie, and we she could she was our production manager, and it was talking about f turning the corner formative events. We were building a console called Idea at the time, and we would make six of them a month, but I'd make one at a time, and we were always late. And she came in, and she was a stage manager, and took one look at this and said, we make six a month, let's make six at a time. I was like, Eureka, why didn't I think of this? <laughs> right. So um, Susan was our production manager, and um, it was really an important part of this. However, we'd get Katie to bed, and we'd get into bed and exhausted, and one of us would say, did that ship today? And shoo, then you're talking about business. Right. Um, um, and uh, at the point we bought Lighting Methods, Susan couldn't be part-time mom and, and do that. So um, she had the opportunity to spend the time with um, Kate and James growing up a lot. Um, and so we have two kids. Um, Kate is now 31, James 26. And all the way through the growing up, I didn't want them to work at the company. Right. I, um, I, for a lot of reasons, I'd seen other people who had gone into their family business mm -hmm. and really not found it satisfying. I think it was very important for them to find their own passions. Mm -hmm. um, and the other part is that they didn't want this is my game. They didn't want to compete against me. Um, and. Uh, I can say that I am batting zero. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Kate uh, got a degree from Williams College um, in theater design and art history and did downtown theater for a couple of years and um, decided that wasn't the life she wanted. And then we, when we remodeled the New York office, she signed on to move boxes and ended up doing a lot of the scenic design for it. Mm -hmm. uh, as you've been in the office, it's, got, it's filled with all these Art Deco Easter eggs of ETC, and this was really Kate's creativity. So she designed straight show booths and is a marketing communication writer. Our son, James, got a degree in political science, and my brother, um, after a career in physics, went into politics, and he's a congressman in Illinois, so James worked for his campaign for a while, helping build Dial for Dollars, which is sadly what congressmen spent half their time doing, and um, decided politics wasn't what he wanted to do, and so he's come back. and. Um, worked in R&D for a while and now is in HR. And then a few years ago when I was diagnosed with a serious illness, Susan came back to help get the affairs in order. And so essentially my whole family is at work. Um, right. And that's just my direct family. Right. The rest of the family is the ETC family. Sure. And so I got to tell you that 24-7 um, sharing an office with your wife is bliss.
Yeah. <laughs> Total Excellent. bliss. Excellent. <laughs> Not um, many people can say that. Right? Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, but no, it's uh, so that has made it even, I guess, more difficult to do stuff that isn't so ETC related. Even right. when we go out to dinner, we have to make an effort not to talk about work. Right. Um, sure. But, uh, but it's, it, yeah, I'm it's, sorry. It's, it's, in, it's in your blood, so. Pretty much. Pretty where's much. the harm? Mm -hmm. Right? You mentioned your illness. Mm -hmm. Do you want to uh, talk sure. about that a um, what, in June, about two and a half years ago, I was visiting a colleague in our Rome office, Fulvio Catoni, who was suffering from cancer, and um, I had a stomach ache, so I went to see his doctor, and his doctor thought it was something and gave me some medication. I came home and saw my doctor, and he said, well, that doesn't sound right, and did a, an X-ray and said, oh, you need to have a CAT scan and an MRI, and you go from, in 10 days, from having a stomach ache to having stage four cancer with a really dire prognosis. Mm -hmm. um, and this happened, and it was, you know, a terrifying thing. Yeah. Um, the, and it was interesting, because I felt obligated to share the news with everybody at work, because um, I felt like if I wasn't, I was lying to them. And um, so I had a company meeting, and explained what's going on in general terms. And the outpouring of love and support from the ETC family is incredible. And is a big part of, you know, so I'm beating the odds. My brother found me a doctor in Chicago who was doing a clinical study on what I had and it's working. You know, I'm going from a, a few months to now two and a half years and shit, I feel great. Right. You know, I feel better than I did when I was diagnosed. Um, I'm working more than full time. I'm going skiing. Um, and part of it is the medicine is interesting. My brother who found this doctor wanted to quiz the doctor to see if he was doing everything for me. So we went to a fundraiser where he spoke. And at dinner, Bill was buttonholing Dr. Catanacci. And I was talking to another cancer survivor. And I was explaining how important hugs were. And my brother interrupted the conversation. He heard that. And he said, would you rather have the hugs or the medicine? And this is his <laughs> science mind. And I said, I need both. Right. They're both critically important. Sure. And the other thing that it brings out is so many people have come up to me, people at work, people in the industry, and explained a battle they have had or a family member's had. And it's something that touches too many people. And um, the the support is, you know, whatever I can give back for what I had received is really critically important. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the lessons I've learned from other people have been fantastic. Yeah. So I'm still here. So, yeah. so now you consider Susan came back to help me get the affairs in order and figure out, okay, the first thing we had to do at work was say, what, if I'm not here, who's going to pick that up? Right. And what is it? You know, so yeah. <laughs> apparently there was a meeting with the man, Dick held a meeting with the managers saying, okay, we have to figure out what Fred does, so if he's not here, we can do it. And um, I think there was a lot of head scratching going on. What, what the hell do I do? Um, but um, so made concrete plans to give away things like product strategy and this sort of thing, the various things that I thought I was very involved in. And um, the uh, I did this, we you know, just said, okay, you're gonna cover this, you're gonna cover this, and then I made this mistake of not dying. Right, yeah. are they letting so, you back in? Well, <laughs> did I ever leave is a better question. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. The whole time frame was possibly very short. And um, so what, I'm finally actually getting to now is those responsibilities and the authority that I said I would give to these people, uh, I actually now have to do it. And I have to do it while I'm here. Um, and it's 
really a, to see that come to, to be, it, it just kind of reinforces, maybe I should have done it a hell of a lot longer mm -hmm. ago. Um, because, you know, people are starting to make, take control and lead. And, you know, I've always felt that that ETC needed leadership and what would come after me wouldn't necessarily lead it in the same direction. It just needs to be led. Right. And that's what we are really trying to build. Um, it's also a pretty interesting thing. Well, I hope that I'm around for a while longer, it turns out. Um, but the ability to, oh, this sounds really weird. Um, this has brought, given me an opportunity to get a lot closer to people. It's not like getting nailed in a car accident or a motorcycle accident where people don't, you don't have a chance to right. sort things out. And, right. um, the other thing, you know, Susan and I went through this whole, or the whole family went through gallows humor, you know, making mm -hmm. jokes about it. Yeah. It's not as funny any longer, yeah. but that's because I don't expect to die, so I don't have to make those jokes. Exactly. My first trip to Middleton and the tour of Town Hall was, was, was extraordinary. Town Square. Town Square, excuse me. Um, what possessed you to do that? Okay, well... Town Square is a themed space that is our lobby, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and it come, before we built this building, we, which was in 2004, I think we opened it, um, we had grown and we were in eight different buildings and each building had its own purpose. We built spotlights in one, dimmers in another, R&D in another. And as a result, each building kind of developed its own culture. And within a business, you end up with different cultures. Everybody resents the sales people because they travel around in expensive reports and this sort of thing. Sales re resents manufacturing because they can't build the stuff they sold. Manufacturing resents R&D because they design products that can't be built. Okay, So those kind of nat natural uh, tensions within an organization. Um, but really, when we started looking at it and even planning the building, the first thing we did was to look at the de demographics of the company. and. One of the things we found is that we actually had ethnic concentrations in some of the buildings. And oh my God, that got my liberal knee jerking. How are right. we doing this? And um, when we looked into it, we found out that wasn't the case. Um, that uh, there's a large Hmong population in, the area, in this area, and a good portion of the workforce building Source 4s were of Hmong descent. And there was an extended Puerto Rican family in the Dimming building. And what actually had happened when we looked into it is that Somebody got a job and it was a good place to work, so the next opening they would sell, tell their brother, sister, cousin, aunt, and so it happened kind of naturally. Right. But my fear in looking at the building is when we were under one roof, would we find out we really didn't like each other very well? And so we wanted to, we posed this problem to the architects we interviewed, and they, uh, several suggested a situation or that rather than do the classic thing where you build a glass office tower for the executives and the carpet dwellers and um, a boring square factory and maybe put a round cafeteria that no one crosses the center line on, um, that that didn't appeal at all. But what they proposed was something Herman Miller, the furniture company, had done, which is they had a pop, our population was about half manufacturing and half um, uh, people working in offices. And what they did was to build a, a long common space between the two factions, and they put some manufacturing on some side and some administration on the other. So what they had was a long interface between the departments, so they got a lot of mingling. And this made a lot of sense. Geograph or ge the geology of the land prevented us from putting that hallway in the right place. So then somebody said, let's build a town square. And everyone in the design meeting said it was their idea. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, the, so the primary purpose of Town Square was to draw people together. And um, so even programming the building, figuring out what departments, the adjacencies of departments, we put departments around Town Square that would draw us to Town Square. So there's a storefront that is an insurance sales office, and that's our HR help desk. There's a typewriter repair store, and that's our um, IT help desk. And so those were all things that would draw us in and, and draw us together. Um, and it's themed, um, and when the architect heard the phrase town square, his first rendering, suggested renderings, or to suggest the theming, were of a provincial southern Wisconsin town with a church 
a steeple and a courthouse and a movie theater. And we got enough flack for being in Wisconsin in this industry <laughs> that um, I didn't want to make a bucolic statement. And I'm a trite guy, and I really love Edward Hopper. So I brought in a, a print of the Nighthawk Diner, the right. Nighthawks, and um, I said, I want to build this. Then we hired a scene designer, Paul Santarud, to flesh out the idea. He heard what we were saying. He said, well, if you're going to do Hopper here, do Hopper all the way around. So most of the facades are interpreted Hopper work, otherwise known as bastardization of it. Um, and then uh, we really wanted, to, I wanted to build a scenery. This is, okay, all these other reasons I've just said, I really wanted to build a scenery. Right. And so I went to Dick. We had moved the factory in, and we were finishing out the offices, and we hadn't done any of the theming. And I went to Dick Titus, who's our president, and um, said, Dick, can I take three months off and build Town Square? And he said, no, knowing he was going to lose. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, the scene designer quit to take a different job before he did any working drawings. So I had renderings, and I had the architectural plans for the building, and I did enough research to find the three most expensive scenery houses as far away from Wisconsin as possible. I set out, that, that said, this, this is all the documentation you're going to get. I want a fixed price quote for installation in Wisconsin in two weeks. And I, only one company even bothered to respond. It was so stupidly high, which was my target. I took it into Dick and said, look, for this we can buy a wood shop, build it in two weeks, a bald face lie, and keep the wood shop. So then I went to, he threw in the towel, said okay. So then I went to Bill Florak, who is one of the guys from Lighting Methods. His nickname is Flash, and he is one of the most brilliant guys. I've ever met. If there's ever something you have to figure out why it isn't working, he's the guy. And so, um, and working with him, he and I can take, we're designing a coffee cup, we can slice it down the middle and say, you design that half, I'll design that half, and they fit together without talking. It's a great experience. So, Flash and I worked arm in arm for 16 weeks. We had seven carpenters, seven scenic artists. The real beauty of it is the scenic painting, which was led by Sue McElhaney, who's a local, an 829 scenic artist. And we just kind of built it. And um, it's great fun. And, but that was all built with a 1940s vintage Tanowitz table saw. And this is when I found out you could buy units of MDF, which is mm -hmm. the, the size, you know, 40 sheets of MDF. Right. And uh, some hand routers and a chop saw. And so uh, we developed a couple of mottos when we do these theming projects. One is, it's only scenery, which means it's cartoon carpentry. Some of the carpenters wanted to bevel the edges of the window sills. No, it's a 30 foot rule. You don't need right. to do this. Right. Another is it's all MDF, meaning it's all full materials. Right. And the last is because we can. Because you can. Yeah. Right. And so, subsequently, we did the themed our London office, um, at which point, every time we do a building project, I try to add another mission critical piece of equipment to our wood shop. <laughs> and this is when we added a four foot by eight foot CNC router with a six tool changer for London, and then when we did the New York office, for some reason that wasn't a big enough router, so we gave that to manufacturing, and now I have a five foot, I'm sorry, we have a five foot by 12 foot <laughs> CNC <laughs> router with a 12 tool changer and a seven drill drill block on it, and um, so. Only the bare necessities. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but then again, we build our furniture systems with it. We, right. um, we do manufacturing stuff on it as well, right. so. Um, but so you can justify it. I absolutely. <laughs> Gilbert Helmsley was your, one of your mentors, mm -hmm. and I, 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 I suspect you had others throughout the years, and you have become a mentor to so many people. Suckers. <laughs> <laughs> that well may be. But why? Why do you do that? Well, it's interesting the way you brought that up. The I don't know, about 1990, a group of us were sitting around complaining, wondering, a bunch of people at ETC are about the same age and started in the business right after college or in our early 20s. And, you know, Vasallo and Bill Gallinghouse and Ann Valentino and others, and we were sitting around um, saying, where are the kids with fire in their bellies like us? And um, Tim Burnham, who was working with us at the time, and he's an English fellow, and he was part of the conversation. He said, I think I know the problem, and it's us. And we said, oh, okay, this is good. What is it? And he said, I want you to think for a moment, picture in your mind somebody you would consider a mentor. And we all saw somebody. And 
He said, now, I'm willing to bet that that person isn't 10 years older, that they're at least 20 years older than you are. And to a person, he nailed it, right? right? And his premise was very interesting, that if you're looking to draw and develop people in their early 20s, and you're only 30, you look at them as your competition. And it's not natural to make them want to make them better than you are. Mm. And the other, the other thing that can f play into it is you're not necessarily confident enough in your career to think you've got any pearls of wisdom, right? So it was really a valid point. And so we weren't actively committed to, to developing the people. We were looking for those people to be given to us from other development things. And at that point, we, um, in the late 90s, every company at LDI would throw the biggest, stupidest prop party to show right. how important we are as companies. And you know, we were spending $70,000 a show, getting 1,300 people drunk, and it wasn't doing anything for us. But no company could back out of this because it would mean you'd be going out of business. Right. Um, so we did something different. We changed that party to the following. We, we selected 12 graduate lighting students and um, they put out a, an appeal, they applied, and we gave them full, full passes to LDI. We flew them in, we said, you have only one obligation for, to us. Other than that, you're completely on your own. And that obligation was one evening, we, would, we got a, a handful of really high-powered industry people, professionals, designers, commercial people as well. And uh, we said, and we had an event, where we have a couple of rules. There can be no two professionals in a conversation unless there's a student involved. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would just sit in the corner and chair. And um, so this turned out to be a really f wonderful thing the first time we did it, because here you had all these professionals who wanted to be mentors. They were to a point where they, in their career, they wanted to share what they knew. And so, and here they had a really hungry audience. And for the kids, for the students, it was, a networking opportunity that was just great. Right. You know, that, that first year, a couple of the students were complaining to Jim Tetlow, who's a, a theming designer and mm -hmm. such, um, a very successful designer. They were complaining that they didn't get attention in somebody else's stand, and he said, I'll fix that. And he took them by the hand down to the stand and walked up to the president of that company and said, pay attention to these kids. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so over the course of time, and now we've been doing this for, boy, probably close to 20 years, right. um, that it, we are now down to six or seven students at a time. Um, we bring in international students. And um, you know, at, at one point, it got to be too big again, so we had to pare it back down. Sure. But then Paula Dinkle, who's a broad, uh, Disney designer um, and has been one of the professionals who's come to this, a few years ago said, I think that we aren't doing enough that we should try to set up a longer-term mentoring program where some of these professionals can help, can link up with the kids. So she almost single-handedly put together this effort that she, that we match up the kids with mentors even before they meet. And I guess now they get to um, audition each other. And the professionals have agreed not to give them work, but to be there and to talk to them or to answer the right. phone all the time. And almost every student um, ends up going and either helping or watching a production, mm -hmm. and it builds a, a more intimate relationship and support right. for it. Um, so the, the people who've come through this program, um, a lot of them have become uh, very successful designers. Some have worked for us, some have worked for Disney. Um, some, and I think this is as big a victory as any, have said, my God, I don't want to do this, and gone off and found some other passion. Um, uh, so it, it really is a good thing, and everybody comes away from this feeling good. Right. Um, you know, the image of Michael Valentino, another Disney designer, right. holding court. <laughs> he has a great time and does a right. great job for the, for the students. Right. Yeah, and they eat it up. Well, it, and it does bring the people in. You know, each of us had people, Gilbert for me, or Joel Rubin for somebody, right. that it's really useful. Pete Fowler Sr. for me. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. 
Before we started taping, we were talking about the challenges of succession planning in a business. You right. started your own business. Where is it going to go after you? This sort of thing. Sure. Um, and this was a real issue for the shareholders of ETC because we're all of the same age. And right. while ETC has grown beyond anybody's dreams, um, the reality is that it's, you know, most of Susan's and my assets are tied up in this illiquid privately held company. And so what happens to it? And we've seen, I've seen too many great companies in our business fail when they are sold, when it, in the transition from the, the early stage or the first the founders, that sort of oh, thing, yeah. to another generation. Right. You go public, that worked really well for Very Light. Um, you sell out to a conglomerate who doesn't care, doesn't yeah. understand what you do, and I, this was the last thing I wanted to have happen to ETC. Mm -hmm. Absolutely terrifying. Yeah. And so for most of a year, in 2014, the three shareholders, Bob Gilson and Gary, and actually Susan and I, um, so I guess that's four, we tried to sort this out. And um, we couldn't come to a conclusion because every time we came up with a plan, one of our estate planners would throw a monkey wrench into it. So in frustration, you know, we, uh, in the spring of 2015, I got the shareholders together and, you know, I have to bribe Gary with Little Debbie cakes for him to come <laughs> to share shareholders meetings. But it seems to be an awfully high price. It is, it is. It cost me 12 boxes on his birthday. But um, he, uh, we got together and I said, listen, we can't resolve this contractually, apparently. Can, let's imagine a, a situation where our estate goes into a trust. What direction can, is there a direction we can give that trustee that would save the company? And um, so I asked the question, I said, what, what is your definition of maximum shareholder value? And Gary piped up right away and he said his view of maximum shareholder value is not the most money in the pockets of his, his heirs, but that ETC is a thriving independent company in 100 years. Right. And that just made sense. And we all said, yes, that's it. Um, didn't solve any problems, but maybe we could give that to, rather than yeah. maximizing the value and selling the stock, give you focus. It, it could give some direction. Then when I was diagnosed with cancer, it became important to resolve this. Sure. Um, and we got back together, and the result was that 